Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us. We've we've decided to join the the COVID webinar craze at uh, QFF, so we're pleased to have you on board. Um, we're going to do a series of these over the next few weeks on different energy topics. Now, first one in the series is on the the very smallest, but also one of the most useful elements, which is hydrogen. I'd like to welcome the Energy Savers team from QFF, John Hay and Rebecca Tickell, that you can see, who will give you a wave. Um, and also our special guest, uh, Dr. Neil Thompson from QUT and ITM Power. Just in the, in the tradition of these webinars, we'll, um, we're, we're keeping everyone muted um, without video, um, but you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a chat function, um, and we invite you to, um, to keep using that. Uh, to ask any questions. Um, and as you can see from the agenda there, the plan is we'll go for about 45 minutes. So I'll just give a brief introduction to the Energy Savers Program. Then uh, Neil, Neil will talk to us about hydrogen for about 20 minutes, and then we'll, um, we'll, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. But we're pleased to carry on if, uh, if there's more questions than that. Um, you'll also see we've activated a poll and it's it's just an easy one with a couple of check boxes. Um, so we're just keen to find out a bit more about you and also what sector you're from and, and what your interest in hydrogen is. Um, and you know, whether there's some interest in, in doing some more work on, on hydrogen in the future. So I'll just keep going. So the, the Energy Savers Project is a, a, a energy efficiency program being delivered by the Queensland Farmers Federation in conjunction with its members, who you can see at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and it's being funded um, with support from the Queensland Government's Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. It's part of the Queensland Government's $2 billion affordable energy plan and aims to help agricultural businesses identify and realise energy and productivity improvements on farm. Um, it, it followed a couple of other energy audit programs um, that mean um, by the time we've finished our audits in a few months time, we'll have done audits on over 300 farms across Queensland. So I mentioned it's audits and we're doing energy audits to the Australian standard AS3598 on all the farms. Um, uh, the type of audit, the level of detail we go into varies on the farm and, and we sort of discuss that between the, the auditor, the farmer and, and the case manager before we start the audit. So it follows a systemic, systematic process and an energy audit will deliver areas in uh, recommendations on how to improve consumption, um, improve productivity and reduce carbon emissions. So I'll just give you a bit of a couple of the highlights of the, um, the audits so far. This, this is generally the industry sectors covered by the audits uh, with a number of audits on the, on the left axis and, and the sectors across the bottom there. So you can see we've got, got a bit of a spread of farms throughout Queensland. Um, and we've, these are the, um, a bit of an indication of some of the energy savings that we've identified so far from the audits, um, over a bit over 5 million kilowatt hours from the um, 127 audits that we've included in this. Um, and those farms that are participating in this program are potentially eligible for um, up to 50% of their implementation costs at a, at a rebate of up to $20,000 per farm, which again is provided by the uh, Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. And here's a bit of an indication of some of the recommendations that the audits are finding. So um, it's not no surprise that most of the audits are identifying um, pumping and irrigation opportunities. Um, and you can see there uh, quite a lot of pump replacements, um, quite a lot of variable speed drives, some of both. And then a few things there, some irrigation changes and pump maintenance. Like irrigation changes might be literally a change of irrigation system. Um, or pipe, piping upgrades or removal of right angle bends and those kind of things. And on the right hand graph there, you can see um, a range of other types of uh, recommendations that are coming through, heating and cooling, factoring in big, quite a few insulation recommendations and those sort of things as well. So really covering uh, quite a range of activities on farm. And um, we, as part of the audits, we're asking the auditors to give us 
um, recommendations on the ideal size of solar for the farms. And, and that, that's generally the spread of what they're coming up with. So, so sizes range in scale, mainly from five up to 30 kilowatts. Um, and 30 kilowatts is the, is the size at which it's still considered a micro-embedded generating unit under the um, Ergon, uh, in the Ergon network area. Uh, but there are a couple of big ones, 50 and 100 kilowatts there, where um, some farms with some, some larger energy consumption. So quite a, quite a lot of um, varying sizes of uh, solar PV is being recommended. So with, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our special guest, uh, Neil Thompson. I'm just going to share Neil's slides, and Neil's going to... Um, prompt me to move on when the time's right. So Neil, Dr. Neil Thompson is, is, is uh, an adjunct associate professor at the Institute of Future Environments at QUT. He's also the managing director for ITM Power Proprietary Limited in Asia Pacific and director of the Australian Hydrogen Council so Neil's undertaken award-winning research at QUT Australia and KIT Germany in his role as adjunct associate professor with IFE. His work in the field of integrated hydrogen energy systems has been regularly published in the USA and Europe, leading to his recent appointment as managing director of ITM Power for the APAC. Since then, he's developed a number of local reference sites for ITM's rapid response, PEM electrolyzers across mobility, renewable chemistry, and power to gas sectors in partnership with key international clients. I'll ask uh, Neil to take over. Thanks very much, Neil. We do appreciate you um, being here to present to us. Unfortunately, we can't see Neil because uh, he's he's had a camera problem. But we can we can uh, we won't get to see his face, but we can see his slides. Thanks very much, Neil. Yep. Cheers, Andrew, and uh, thanks everyone for your uh, attendance this afternoon. And uh, also thank you to uh, John and Rebecca for helping out with the technology. Yes, we had some camera issues yesterday. I'm speaking to you from the lovely dairy town of Mullaney uh, on the Sunshine Coast in the in southern Queensland, and uh, yeah, bucketing down here at the moment. So that's why we're we're dairy country. Um, but had the pleasure of catching up with Andrew, who I knew in a former life when he was working with the Queensland State Government in the Derm and and doing EcoBiz audits and. I said to Andrew, a lot of the work that we've done since was really based on that foundation of, of taking a, a deep dive and looking at uh, you know, across the board energy usage uh, on farm and uh, also in uh, industry. So uh, a lot of the things you'll see today are based on some of that uh, previous work with, uh, with Andrew. So congratulations, Andrew, on the uh, Energy Savers team. So if we can move on to the first slide next. Um, and I guess, look, this is not just Neil and Andrew and John and Rebecca talking about this. The whole nation is talking about the wonderful subject of hydrogen. Um, I guess we, uh, we've got a lot happening here in Queensland, thanks to our own state government's uh, hydrogen roadmap. But uh, like Springfield and Shelbyville, um, everyone else, uh, state and territory in Australia has a, has a hydrogen roadmap, I think with the exception of Northern Territory. But at least this first slide gives you a view that, look, both the federal government and through COAG, um, all the states and territories are on board and they see hydrogen as being the next, I guess, export opportunity for Australia um, as our dominance in the LNG industry ultimately wanes with uh, new competition coming on board from the US and um, also Qatar. Next one, please, Andrew. And I guess on our own back doorstep, very pleased to be working with uh, the Queensland government and also the federal government. Um, we had an announcement last year, there's a $50 million fund for, this is more at the community level, so it's something that councils are looking at in partnership with, uh, say, people like Ergon, where we can actually get rid of diesel uh, in places like the Daintree and switch to, uh, to hydrogen fuel generation uh, from solar predominantly. Um, so yeah, it really starts to look after a, a natural resource, which uh, when our tourism gets uh, back on board up post COVID, um, yeah, we'd like to look after the Daintree. So some very exciting stuff happening on our back doorstep with, uh, with hydrogen. Sorry, Andrew. And I guess just briefly who we are, ITM, uh, English manufacturer established uh, back in 2002, listed on the London Stock Exchange 2004. Uh, as of October last year, part of the Linda Gas Group, uh, largest gas company on the planet, so we must be doing something right. Um, but basically we make that box in the middle, the electrolyzer, the PEM electrolyzer, uh, 
which stands for proton exchange membrane. This talks about the process where we break down H2O into H2 and O2, and we use renewable energy and waste water, and typically do three things with it. We mix it with other gases, uh, we use it in transport, uh, or we use it to make other chemicals and gases. So it's quite a useful uh, molecule, the, uh, the hydrogen molecule. Cheers, Andrew. All good. So, as I said, back in 2002 to 2012, the company was basically involved in uh, research and development of the actual hydrogen generation technology. And then basically over the last decade, managed to scale up from the original uh, electrolyzers around 10 kilowatts electrical capacity up to 10 megawatts, which is a hundredfold increase. So there's been a lot of uh, learnings in terms of uh, projects, uh, not only here in Australia, but also in Europe and the USA. And uh, we've now just completed uh, construction of the world's largest uh, electrolyzer at the Shell refinery in Germany, which is the largest uh, refinery in Europe. So there's been a lot of learnings along the way. And I guess that's part of the excitement, I guess, here now is we can apply some of that uh, on farm to uh, start looking at reducing not only energy costs, but also transport costs uh, as well. If I can have the next one, Andrew, please. Now, I much mentioned briefly that uh, Linda Gas from, from Germany and uh, Praxair from the USA uh, merged together to form, I think, an $80 billion company last year. Uh, and as part of the uh, acquisition trial that they then went on, uh, they purchased 20% in ITM. So Linda Gas basically owns BOC, uh, which many of you see uh, on farm and in the city around Australia. So basically providing oxygen for hospitals. Um, hydrogen gas for power stations, ironically, they use uh, hydrogen for cooling, uh, but also hydrogen for industry uh, in production of ammonia and explosives. So very active company. You'll often see BOC trailers uh, going up and down the highways around uh, regional Queensland. And basically they're in a position now to start uh, shipping hydrogen to uh, other applications in, uh, in agribusiness. So the aim of the Linda JV is now basically to provide us with a full end-to-end -end solution so that we can look at um, you know, working with Andrew and his colleagues to uh, develop projects and, and work with federal government uh, and state government funding agencies to help fund projects and then basically right down to after sales uh, maintenance and support because the point of having great equipment saving you money if it's not uh, if it's not working so uh, after sales and support is very important uh, I think BAC have the biggest plant in Queensland out in um, Condamine which is a, a 55 ton a day LNG plants, so they're used to doing uh, servicing in, in regional Queensland. Thanks, Andrew. And I guess as an overall philosophy, I touched on earlier some of the work Andrew and I did in the early days together on the ECOBIS program as part of the EPA and DERM. Um, and that's where I learned this philosophy that, uh, you know, we're really changing the way that we provide energy systems uh, on farm uh, to uh, a circular economy. So we don't waste anything. And we certainly minimise the inputs to uh, improve the efficiency of processes such as irrigation, uh, chillers and uh, various other uh, energy consuming devices on farm. But we also look to use renewables at a much lower cost than we're paying for diesel or grid connections. So QT sort of uh, turned this into a recipe, if you like, building that earlier work called ISD, Integrated Sustainable Design. So all projects we work on, we're looking at reducing uh, input costs, reducing waste output costs, and basically also looking at ways to generate new revenues on farm from some of these um, opportunities around, uh, around hydrogen. Thanks, Andrew. And I guess the useful thing about hydrogen, as I said earlier, it's quite a, a versatile molecule. So we can use it for producing heat and also cooling through absorption chillers. We can use it in transport. We can use it for turning it back into electrons if we want to through a fuel cell or a turbine. Um, and also we can use it to make other, other materials such as ammonia, uh, renewable methane. And uh, we can also use the byproducts uh, uh, from oxygen because the byproduct when you split H2O into H2 is O2. So we can actually monetize and, and create new revenues from, uh, from that oxygen that comes uh, generally as a waste product from the, uh, from the electrolyzers. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess this slide just on the right hand side shows you a little bit about that versatility I talked about. So from a fuel perspective, you know, we're already doing cars, buses, trucks, trains, uh, ferries are coming to a uh, island near you in Townsville on Gladstone. 
uh, even down here in South East Queensland, Moreton Bay Islands uh, are getting ready for some fuel cell uh, ferry supply to the ferries. Uh, but also, as I said, we can use it for heating, uh, energy storage, uh, backup power or primary power. Um, but also we're starting to work with uh, Blue Scope and others in, in steel production, uh, oil refineries, and basically uh, then chemical industries, as I said, ammonia and, uh, and methanol. So very versatile and all of those uh, applications on the right-hand side provide uh, additional opportunity for new revenues in, in regional uh, Queensland. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess the nice thing about uh, most of the farms, I did work on the Telstra Countrywide project for some years uh, with uh, Uwasa Batteries and uh, BP Solar. So I spent a lot of time enjoying a lot of hospitality in, in Queensland. And uh, the good thing is, you know, we've got plenty of opportunities and plenty of land to predominantly use solar power is probably the best, uh, best example. I think Andrew was saying through some of the audits that uh, a lot of people have already started on the solar journey, which is a great, uh, great thing to see. In some locations, potentially wind, um, not so much uh, in Queensland, but uh, some of the coastal regions and depending on what sort of farming and topography, there is opportunities for wind as well. But I guess a big one we're seeing more and more is the use of uh, a waste manure, depending on what, what sort of uh, animals and what sort of um, head count you've got. That's uh, certainly something we're seeing more of now. And Queensland's certainly got some great um, expertise through the universities and uh, manufacturers in this whole area of uh, anaerobic digestion to create uh, biogas. But one that surprised me, I don't see a lot of, and, and I think we sh should look at it more, is something I use in a lot of island projects throughout the Pacific and uh, Southeast Asia, is just using organic waste. Um, the Germans and Canadians are experts in this field, just uh, pelletizing uh, waste, uh, waste uh, inorganic waste biomass uh, from forestry products and uh, basically creating um, heat and electricity. So the organic Rankine cycle is, is an underutilized opportunity on farm that we can look at further as part of this, uh, this process with, uh, with energy savers. Thanks, Andrew. And I guess one of the big issues is about hydrogen. As I said earlier, we need H2O, we need water to manufacture hydrogen. So predominantly in the city, we're using wastewater treatment plants and Andrew is helping uh, us connect with some of the regional councils, such as Gundawindi Regional Council, looking at how do we turn the wastewater from this serious treatment plant and the waste oxygen uh, from the electrolyzer into money. And I guess that's exciting thing. So even if you can't make hydrogen on farm yourself due to a limitation of space or availability of renewables or water, um, we can ship hydrogen into the farm uh, from the BOC tankers and just pretty much set up a bullet like a bullet of LPG uh, to provide hydrogen on farm. The nice thing about that, if we do use the hydrogen on farm uh, from those tanks to create electricity and, and hot water, one of the byproducts going back the other way when I'm combining hydrogen and air to make uh, electricity is, uh, is water. So basically um, we can recover water from the fuel cells and put that back on farm, either for making more hydrogen or for using for other purposes on, uh, on farm. So that, that circular approach is something that we're seeing a lot of use in the mining sector now in, in arid regions. So we make the hydrogen around a, a wastewater treatment plant and then ship it by road to, um, or by rail to an area that um, doesn't have a lot of water. So that's the exciting thing about uh, hydrogen. It can actually solve both energy and water issues in the right uh, circumstances. And of course we have availability of uh, bore water, uh, such as my property up here in Mullaney, uh, but also rainwater. And, and I guess it's good to see that, that we're getting some federal funding and state funding around uh, you know, drought proofing our properties in uh, Queensland. So that certainly can potentially help as part of the, um, the hydrogen cycle as well. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess, um, all of this hydrogen production and opportunity on farm is nothing without something to do with it. So the, one of the key points, and I guess this is one of the highest value uh, uses of, of hydrogen, we've started this process in Australia with uh, Toyota and Hyundai passenger cars, but very quickly starting to move into the bus and uh, truck area. So a lot of the fuel cell technology that's being developed in the sort of uh, bus and truck industry is uh, straight away applicable to the heavy duty vehicles that we have on, uh, on farm. So I think Andrew updated uh, some of these photos recently, but uh, the one on the top uh, right hand side is uh, the quad uh, from New Zealand. So there's a few of those running around QUT now at our um, agricultural research centre down in Redlands in the south of Brisbane. Uh, left hand side top is the uh, New Holland tractor um, that also uses a fuel cell stack out of the US, a company called Nivera, who also make uh, forklifts for Heister Yale. 
So again, there's a lot happening uh, on the farm and QUT is actually doing a lot of work uh, on these uh, materials. If they're not uh, driverless, uh, they're certainly uh, suitable for uh, drivers as well. But I guess my personal favourite is the lower left, some of the work we're doing uh, with the US military, both on bikes and trucks. So the Chevy truck you see there, even though we don't have Holden here anymore, um, we will see that Chevy truck in a fuel cell format uh, at a, uh, a dealership near you, whatever they call the dealership now. Uh, and then on the right hand side for those logistics uh, trucks carrying hydrogen around uh, around the southeast Queensland and, and the regions, uh, basically uh, converting to fuel cell uh, trucks as well using clean hydrogen. So that's where it starts to get interesting because that's the highest cost for logistics in, in diesel fuel. Um, we've got a lot of issues around diesel at the moment in terms of fuel security. So not only is this a, a cost saving initiative in transport, but it's also a fuel security issue because I think we've all seen in the press and, and certainly talking to family in the military, um, basically, um, yeah, we're highly exposed to uh, disruptions to our, our foreign uh, oil supplies, which is a ridiculous situation, but there you go. So hydrogen can help with, uh, with that fuel security as well. Thanks, Andrew. I said also we can use hydrogen uh, gas for heating. Um, whether we're using uh, LP or fuel oil, I've done a lot of work in some of our um, cheese factories and we've converted from uh, LP or fuel oil for drying to, um, to a hydrogen blend when they've had problems with uh, LP supply. But as I said earlier, we can also convert that, um, that hydrogen back to electricity when needed overnight or during periods of, uh, of low solar access, um, either via a turbine, where we're actually burning the hydrogen with zero emissions, or via a fuel cell, which essentially is the same technology out of the vehicles. It's essentially a gas battery where we're pumping hydrogen into it and basically drawing air in from outside, and we're actually creating electricity, heat, and water as the byproduct. So whether it's a turbine or a fuel cell generally depends on what grade of hot water you might want from the process. So in the case of a turbine, we're rejecting hot water at a, at a temperature of around 300, 400 degrees C. So we can use that for higher value heating purposes in, in uh, agricultural process, but we can also use that in an absorption chiller, which I think I said at uh, one of the previous conferences, is just like a Kero fridge that my mum used to have at Gunder Windy, uh, basically turning heat into, into chilled water in cold air. So we can use that for, um, for chiller rooms uh, as well for produce. Uh, and I guess we've got hot water, as I said, at any temperature range through uh, from 50 degrees centigrade off the fuel cell stacks through to 300, 400 degrees C for the um, for the micro turbines. So again, we've got quite a range of electricity, chill water and uh, and hot water is needed to uh, you know, replace existing uh, either diesel, uh, LP or um, electrical grid supply to some of these processes at a, um, at a lower cost and, and a more reliable supply. Thanks, Andrew. I guess the other exciting thing, yeah, you know, when we do have hydrogen uh, either on farm or in a, in a sort of regional sense through a council uh, wastewater treatment plant, the opportunity exists to then use some of that waste oxygen. I mean, some of the, the clients we've been working with uh, in council and on farm have uh, set up uh, new aquaculture opportunities. Uh, Project Sea Dragon comes to mind, a large uh, aquaculture play in Western Australia uh, that's using oxygen as a waste product from the electrolyzers and then the hydrogen is being sold for other purposes for making ammonia uh, in the Pilbara. Um, so there's great opportunities to get a, uh, a waste gas such as oxygen and uh, turn that into some other additional on-farm revenue as a diversification. Um, but also if we are using uh, biogas on-farm out of uh, anaerobic digesters, the waste CO2 out of that biogas can also be combined with the, uh, the hydrogen to make other chemicals such as uh, methanol, or DME, dimethyl ether, and, and both of those can allow you to uh, do blending with diesel, or uh, in DME's case, it's a straight drop in replacement for diesel fuel. So again, uh, improving on-farm resilience by creating your own uh, own fuel essentially on, uh, on farm using waste products. And I guess if we're also using uh, fuel cells to convert some of that hydrogen back into electricity from time to time, uh, nitrogen is a byproduct of those fuel cells as well, which can be combined with hydrogen to manufacture ammonia. So look, this is uh, at scale, but certainly I uh, talked to Andrew and the team yesterday that uh, opportunities exist to do these things in, in a, I guess, a co-op type mode uh, and basically look at uh, centralised facilities that all can benefit from um, if your farm operation isn't at a scale that can take advantage of some of these uh, extra new revenues. But uh, you could certainly contribute to that with um, some of the input uh, feedstock. So again, 
another thought process around uh, we start the the process looking at saving energy but we then uh, through that process look at creating new revenues on uh, on farm thanks andrew So I guess um, one of the great projects uh, we have in Queensland, I talked about the Daintree uh, off-grid power, but certainly the last, I think almost three years, the Queensland government's been working with the Gladstone uh, Regional Council to basically set up a new abattoir on the uh, Yarwin facility, which is a state government owned facility, uh, and looking at how do we actually compete in the, uh, the world uh, beef, uh, beef market. Uh, I was quite astounded to see some of the numbers coming out of the US. Uh, you know, their processing costs 140, 150 a head. Uh, stuff out of uh, Southeast Asia at under $100 a head. So, you know, at around $300 a head uh, out of the abattoir, how do we compete? So, we took the eco biz and the closed loop approach to the abattoir from day one, and we included transport, both the reefers going from the abattoir down to Gladstone Port, refrigerated, but also the larger doubles and other, other trucks coming in from the feedlots uh, further out uh, to close the whole loop so the abattoir becomes self-sufficient not only making hydrogen for its own energy needs within the abattoir for the rendering plant um, but also using the, uh, the hydrogen gas to refuel its own uh, logistics fleet. So this has had uh, state government approval, it's a project of state significance so there's some uh, press around this at the moment um, but I guess it's a good example how we can actually use hydrogen in this sort of closed loop thinking by the energy savers um, and basically get a, a facility that's uh, giving us a competitive edge at around $200 a head um, at this point in time. Uh, so that's really the sort of the end game, if you like, of what we could potentially do with hydrogen as a fuel source and uh, both upstream and, and downstream processing facilities such as the, uh, such as the abattoir. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess what have we learned, <laughs> both here in Australia and overseas, but also, as I said, the prior work done with, uh, with Andrew and his team and uh, the work that's ongoing now with energy savers. I think the old adage is, uh, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So I guess uh, full credit to, to the state government and, and the QFF in terms of the work being done to at least document energy usage on farm as a starting point using the AS3598 audits. Um, so at least as a peg in the ground to get a good understanding of the volume of energy being used and also the current average cost per kilowatt hour or megajoule if it's gas um, and starting to look at okay well how do we start using some of this uh, hydrogen technology solar power batteries etc the full range of clean technology suites to see which ones are, are right for your particular uh, agribusiness application so second chart down the bottom there is an international chart that's put out by the funders Lazard each year that looks at the various relative costs of, of various technologies. So it compares battery with solar, it compares hydrogen with solar and wastewater for fuel cells, turbines uh, against conventional grid, um, diesel, etc. So it starts to give you an idea of potentially where the savings could be if you did transition to an alternate uh, technology uh, process on farm around energy. And I guess I've suggested to Andrew as well that um, even though some of the audit uh, have already been done, that uh, they can also provide a platform AS3598 has a transport component. So again, you can start to combine the energy information that Andrew and the team have collected uh, on farm with some transport uh, information on uh, quad bikes, bikes, anything using diesel on farm or in any contractors coming in and taking products away or delivering uh, feedstock. Um, you can start looking at where the savings might lie on the transport side of the fence as well. When you get to that point, you start to understand what the mix might look like. And that's when you start calling in, you know, we've used Pitt and Sherry Consulting Engineers. There's various uh, people out there who are certainly part of the Queensland uh, funding program um, who can start to look at uh, proper studies and grant applications for projects uh, on farm. And certainly, uh, I think the money that's available both federally uh, and also uh, we'll talk about that in question time that Andrew's got a few new funding sources as well. Um, can be used to do some some detailed engineering and then look at um, getting a sign off on a, uh, a project to uh, go to construction. So um, yeah, a four step process and that could be a year to two years really depending on how much information is to hand and what's got to be uh, dug out of, out of records, et cetera. But there is a process there and I think you know, if you've already started with energy savers, you're certainly on the road to, uh, to savings in that, uh, in that process. So I think that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, I was really more interested in participating in some uh, Q&A and, and trying to help uh, share some uh, information on funding and 
how you sort of start on this process or continue the process if you're already part of the uh, the energy savers uh, audit uh, cohort. So thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Neil. Um, thank you very much, Neil. Um, stop sharing screen there. Um, so just yeah, there's a couple of questions spring to mind, Neil. Thanks for that really good um, summary of where things are at. Some of, the, some of those projects you mentioned, um, for the people that are listening, we have, um, there's an article on the QFF website in our newsroom about hydrogen and a lot of those, there's a link to stories about um, uh, some of the cars, trucks, uh, on-farm vehicles, uh, the Case tractor, um, the work that Toyota's doing in Melbourne at Altona, some of those kind of things um, and how, how um, Cummins Diesel are doing some uh, hydrogen injection um, prototyping and all that kind of stuff. So there's some really good other background information there for people. Um, I've just got a couple of questions from, from uh, people listening. Um, the first one is um, about the water, Neil. So um, are there any water losses in the fuel cells and how clean does the water need to be for uh, electrolysis? Yeah. Well, if we take the second one first, it's a very good question. The nice thing about the electrolysis process is uh, we learnt the hard way in the early days putting um, some of these devices out into mining situations. We have onboard uh, reverse osmosis, Andrew, to actually filter the water. So we're quite lucky that we can design that to suit a wide range of water inputs. So I guess it's really a case of we normally take some water testing and uh, use that to uh, determine what grade of RO is needed uh, on board. Uh, and then that basically ensures that pure water is presented to the face of the electrolyzer. So um, it's almost like a built-in uh, insurance policy, if you will. So that's on the production side. I think touch on the fuel cell side, you're generally looking at around a 50% uh, uh, turnaround. So you're basically, whether it's a fuel cell or electrolyzer, if we're putting um, 20 litres of water into electrolyzer to make, uh, say, a kilogram of hydrogen, which does the same work as around a litre of diesel on top, uh, basically, um, we're looking at about a 50% turnaround. So we redistribute 50% of that water back. So the net usage to make a kilo of hydrogen is around 10 litres. So the rest is recycled back. Um, so yeah, there is a, a recycling approach to the water. So we don't want to waste that water. Right, thanks. Uh, the next one's uh, about scale. So um, turning to sort of on-farm use, What's the scale at which hydrogen would become a commercial option? So, so what sort of electricity and or diesel consumption would a farm need to be to, to, to start thinking hydrogen's a viable option? Yeah, well, I guess um, looking at some of these uh, fuel cell uh, technologies that are commercially available now that are being used and have been used in, in Queensland for some time in state emergency facilities, and also the micro turbines for that matter. Um, basically, they started around 60 kilowatts, Andrew, electrical. So I guess if you look at a, if you're on grid connection, if you look at a, um, you know, a bill and see that there's a peak demand of, of something around 60 kilowatts, or you might have 30 kilowatts on grid and you might have uh, 30 kilowatts uh, off grid on a diesel uh, jenny for some uh, irrigation. As long as you sort of around that 60 kilowatt mark, you know, there's devices there from either the turbines or the, uh, the hydrogen turbines or, or the fuel cells that can start to generate electricity at that, uh, at that level. So that's probably the entry point to look at around that, say, 60 kilowatt mark, which from some of the numbers that you're sharing with us uh, and the team on the audits, that's not an uncommon sort of uh, scale. So that's certainly encouraging. And I think some more around the sort of 100, 200 kilowatt mark, which uh, certainly gets into uh, serious uh, opportunity in terms of uh, transfer to hydrogen. Yeah, thanks. So, so an irrigator, Neil, that might be, you know, they might have a 100 kilowatt or more pump. Um, clearly at the moment, um, you put PV on um, putting any, if, if it's not grid connected, any sort of storage would be like a battery storage would be just not not work in that situation but so 100 kilowatt yep. PV yep. and bigger um, there's potential to um, when you're not irrigating if that's a, a, most of the year you, there's potential to generate some hydrogen for use on farm then at that scale. Yeah correct and, and I guess that's the thing that um, if you've got the land area um, there's plenty of people there Andrew that we talked about too would come in and, and do 
basically large scale PV on a, uh, I guess, a power purchase agreement uh, arrangement where I've got some cheap electrons. And as you said, during certain times of the year, um, I'm not really doing anything with them. So um, essentially using the hydrogen to store that, uh, that renewable energy. And I guess, as you said, this is where, you know, batteries play a critical role in the short term. You know, they're a useful half hour device in our electricity network, or even in the fuel cell vehicles, we have a battery buffer that takes the energy back into the battery when we're running down a hill on regenerative braking. Uh, but you're right, if you've got around 100 kilowatts of PV and you're doing nothing with it for the rest of the year, well, there's certainly uh, the scale, there's opportunity. Uh, I think I mentioned yesterday, 100 kilowatts is, is one of the older style electrolyzers that were manufactured for Shell for their service stations. But yeah, 100 kilowatts is certainly uh, doable from a, um, from a hydrogen perspective in terms of electrolysis. Yeah, great. And and so, and you mentioned that that sort of PPA or the offtake model. But what what would the capital cost of something around that scale? So, so someone getting into what well, you mentioned, sixty kilowatt. What what sort of cost would would an electrolyzer of that scale be? Well, I think at sixty kilowatts uh, electrical, if you don't have the PV on farm, you'd just be buying a tank of hydrogen from BAC to be kept in a bullet on farm. So, I guess in that case you're not paying the capex, you're just paying it on a uh, opex basis. So basically you, know, you might be looking at something around $1,500 a watt for the, for the turbines or the fuel cells. Um, but it's really critical to make sure that uh, we're buying effectively on farm from a local, as I said, council who's got some cheap hydrogen uh, from a, a sewage treatment plant and uh, you might be paying around $5, $6 a kilo for the hydrogen. So the net impact is that the levelised cost of energy coming out of the electrolyzer, oh, sorry, out of the uh, turbine or the uh, fuel cell, is commensurate with what we're paying for um, for grid uh, grid power or uh, PV battery. If you're starting to look at making electrolysis on farm yourself, um, well, then basically we're looking at a similar sort of cost around that sort of fifteen hundred dollar a watt type uh, type arrangement. So. I guess generally, I think as we discussed, the preference is to provide a, a what I'd call a GPPA, a gas and power purchase agreement. So you're getting gas and electricity at a cost commensurate with what you're currently paying for LP and or grid electricity. So that's really where the preference is because the uh, model, I guess, that's being used by BOC is not dissimilar to some of the solar players. Andrew was saying, look, we'd rather own the plant and just basically uh, provide the uh, provide the gas to you as a service. And that seems to be this move towards as a service. So, you know, uh, solar as a service, mobility as a service. So same thing goes for some of the trucks and tractors we're looking at now, but it's going to charge you what I'd call a wet lease from the aviation industry where the fuel's included. Um, and that's pretty much the model we use in the UK with Toyota. When you buy a Toyota in the UK, um, the fuel is included in your lease rate. So um, those sort of models are, are really what's being considered here. And that way your capex is spared for, you know, critical, you know, what I'd call front of house equipment that's uh, necessary to, you know, the ongoing business on farm. The grudge purchases around electricity and gas and, and you know, some of the logistics um, can be done on a uh, as, you, as you go basis. So that uh, working capital is reserved for important stuff like um, drought proofing and, and uh, others. Yeah, okay, thanks. So it sounds like it's it's, it's going to be more of that kind of that kind of model rather than people going Approach. out and buying their own gear. Yep. Yep. We're seeing the same in other industries. Andrew, hotels, for example, they don't want to buy electricity plant. They just want to run, you know, look after the the customers. So I guess yeah, it's a similar sort of thing. So I think it's a it's a big transition uh, in the future, and particularly when you're relying on others for maintenance, um, there's got to be that high level of reliability and trust there. And also when there's other byproducts like oxygen that are of value to someone else, I suppose, then they can, they can factor that into that. Well, it's that been interesting. Uh, ox yeah. O oxygen is certainly one of the um, unsung heroes, I think, Andrew, of the hydrogen story, because basically at the moment, BOC and others, I guess, through, in the, through the COVID issues, both in Australia and around the world, you know, on through the roof and uh, basically they can't make enough of the stuff which is quite ironic because we do just get it out of the air but they've only got limited manufacturing capacity so exactly that hospitals and others are now looking at that waste product as a something you can make at site rather than something you make somewhere else and ship in so again it, it ends up uh, you know being a, a useful gas and as you said that also helps to drive down that cost of hydrogen gas in the first place and therefore cost of electricity hot water and, and water if you're making it on, uh, on the farm. Okay, great. Um, 
So actually another question here, how many kilograms of hydrogen would you produce with a 100 kilowatt solar PV system over the course of a year? I can tell, yep, I can tell, well, I can tell you daily, right? That's about 40 kilos a day. So um, to put it in perspective, um, the cars are using around five kilos to give us 800 Ks. Um, trucks and buses are around 30 kilos, so basically for the same same distance. So 40 kilos, you know, I generally think about it in a transport sense, but from an energy sense, you know, that's basically you know, running a, um, a 60 kilowatt turbine uh, overnight. So there's a nice matching sort of facility that if I want 12 hours overnight or six to 12 hours overnight out of the turbine for pumping uh, or other, other processes on farm, uh, electrical. Um, yeah, 100 kilowatts with a 60 kilowatt turbine would be a nice uh, a nice match. And obviously, if you can start moving the transport over, even if it's just blending in an internal combustion engine, like you said earlier, um, you could double that size and put in 200 kilowatts to give you both transport and station repair. So again, it, it comes back to your audits, Andrew. You know, it's just getting a handle on you know, what are the critical aspects uh, where energy is being used on farm at the moment, where there could be a transition and, and also looking to improve that reliability because I guess a lot of us like up here at Mullaney as well suffer from pretty pretty poor grid. So uh, if I've got a uh, pretty poor grid or I'm running out of diesel and I can't get a shipment due to floods, well, at least I can make something on farm to see me, see me through. Yeah, good one, thanks. And, and just another question about um, just the, the consistency or con uh, are they able to run, or do they need to run full time? Can you, can you, if you do have a PV system hooked up to a pump, and you need to run the pump, can you? Does the electrolysis process need to keep running, or can you just put that on pause while you're irrigating, for example? Yeah, no, very good question. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why ten years ago, uh, ITM and others such as Linda decided to go down this PEM route because the PEM route is like a variable speed drive on a, on a, on a pump. It basically can go from zero to 100% load in under a second, and it can go from 100% load back down to zero in under a second. So that rapid ramp up and de-ramp is actually part of the characteristic. We used to use alkaline electrolyzers in our power stations in the 80s, but um, they're a, a set and forget. You've got to warm up to 100%, leave it at 100%, and then shut it down. So you're right. The newer technology now, yeah, so I can ramp up, and this is why they use it predominantly with solar or wind or even pumped hydro, Andrew, the fact that you can load follow to make sure that um, the electrolyzer is only sitting at the load required yep. based on the energy input. You know, it's a variable a variable setting device from zero to 100 and back again. And it's that, that characteristic, again, if you're in a, in a larger uh, on, uh, agribusiness facility and you are grid connected, that on-off characteristic um, is saleable, if you like, to the likes of Ergon, because basically there, as we all know, having problems with stability in the grid as we put more solar farms and wind farms onto the grid to try and drive our levelised cost of energy down, um, but the grid doesn't like it in terms of voltage and, and frequency stability. So uh, the electrolysers are starting to be used by the energy networks as almost like a shock absorber or a sponge. So when I've got spare electrons from intermittent renewables on the grid, I can ramp them up or ramp them down as I've just described. So that is worth its weight in gold. And there's a, a fee that they will pay for access to that. So if you've got storage or you've got something that could be interrupted, you can sell that. It's just like they used to do with hot water systems. Uh, and also now with air conditioners, they can turn them on and off as, as a remote control. But you get paid for that um, service. So again, that's another, like oxygen, Andrew, it's another service that we can use on farm if we reconnect it. Obviously, if it's in an off-grid, just a, a load following situation, we can't derive that revenue. But... As I said, like oxygen, that, that ability to remotely turn on and off and electrolyze at zero to 100, et cetera, um, is worth money to, um, to Ergon and network operators. Yeah, and it sounds like, um, so it sounds like a good coverage of different activities on site. And I'm thinking of things like sugar mills, um, cotton gins, uh, places like um, uh, cold stores where you know, a tomato farm, for example, that might do some of its own drying um, and, and refrigeration. So you, you've got, you can cover a lot of those kind of energy sources, a lot of that heat and power yeah. and cool. Yeah. And I think the more of that you can do, and yeah, I mean, as an electrical engineer, you know, using electrons for heating and cooling is not cost effective, as you know. So 
the more we can do with waste heat from you know turbines or, or the fuel cells or even just burning the hydrogen gas itself um it's better doing you know heating and cooling that way and i guess like i said with the kero fridge or absorption chiller rather than using expensive electrons so you're right as part of that audit process that energy savers is undertaking looking at those thermal loads uh, the more of those you can switch over to a, a cogen or trigen uh, arrangement, uh, the lower that whole levelised cost of energy goes, and then that spills across to the transport fuel cost as well. So it is an integrated approach, as you say, across those um, thermal loads as well as electrical and, and gas loads. Just muting you while I rubbish truck goes past. Um, just one final question. Um, something like we, we've been auditing. Um, piggeries and um, chicken farms and those kind of things where they use a lot of power but um, it varies significantly throughout the course of the year and also heating and uh, whether warming keeping young animals warm can you give an indication so four shed wiener piggery or an eight shed chicken farm or something like that how how you might set a system up for one of those yeah well, I think that's the sort of opportunity, Andrew, that uh, I guess we as a group with yourselves relish because basically it's that first step to say, okay, well, what sort of organic waste have I got to play with? And I guess, again, I would always defer towards, uh, you know, a biogas play, not so much for making energy, but oh, for making electricity, sorry, but for, for the heat uh, opportunity. Um, and then start to look at, okay, I can do, say, 30%. Say, for example, the rendering plant in the abattoir we're doing around 60% from biogas. So the net energy needed for that rendering plant for the hot water in, in, the, uh, in the abattoir is only 30%. So the 60% provided is at a much lower cost because it's coming from, from uh, waste uh, organic materials. So again, I think that's the first step. Look at what the piggery or the farm uh, could do. We looked at some of the stuff up in Toowoomba, a similar thing that um, always go for that uh, organic waste first get some heat out of that and then basically use the balance. Yep. Okay, if... 60-30 um, might be a good split. Yep. Okay, if... if we're getting a few questions come through now too, which is good. So if, if you're... If a farm's generating its own hydrogen, what's the best way to transport it around? Would it be as a gas or liquid fuel cell? I've heard about ammonia, converting it to ammonia. What would you suggest there? Okay, so at the small scale, um, definitely a gas. I mean, the typical tube trailers that uh, BOC use, Andrew, to go up and down the highway in bulk and then decant to, say, like LPG bullets, they're around 200, 300 bar pressure. And that's a known technology and, and readily proven and uh, pretty cost effective if you've got space. Um, once you get up in volumes, you, you know, you're working in a fairly major uh, business farm, you've got a few trucks and you're using a bit of energy. That's when you start to look at um, you start to look at liquid, uh, liquid hydrogen. So anything around say four or five ton a day, um, which is not hard to get to if you've got a pretty major truck fleet. So that might be more a, a council type issue where they've got garbage trucks and buses and such like. But you know a lot of large agribusiness mining companies work with you know, um, start to look at liquid. So that that sort of four ton a day is pretty much a um, a sort of a, a benchmark to start looking at um, at liquid because then it's thousands of times more cost effective uh, and uh, sorry more space effective then um, you've probably got about a 20 30 percent cost differential uh, and uh, basically that's a sort of benchmark ammonia is more an export story um, basically that's uh, you know been talked about as a shipping method for japan and south korea for export hydrogen um, yep. we're not really keen on seeing uh, large shipments of ammonia around the uh, the highways of Queensland because that's uh, yeah, it's quite a dangerous. Uh, so yeah, that's why you know the sort of uh, Queensland nitrates and fertilisers and such. Yeah, that's all um, all pretty um, well secured and great safety case. But we don't want to sort of add to more ammonia domestically. So it's really more an export uh, story. So gas and liquid are pretty much the two carriers we use uh, on farm in, in, in Queensland. Yep. Um, just a question on maintenance. So at that 60 to 100 kilowatt scale we talked about before, is it is it pretty set and forget or would, would you need someone, is it fairly hands-on maintenance? No, it's pretty, and I guess this is the lessons hard learned in terms of doing things in the you know, region of Australia with mining and other things is that, um, yeah, this is pretty much set and forget. Everything's monitored 24-7. 
and I guess uh, basically the twice a year that they look at a uh, eight hour shutdown on the plant for just the preventative maintenance. Um, but I guess having BAC as part of the team, as I said, they've already got plant uh, around Queensland and, and depots. So we're looking at maintenance response. So if we see something remotely that uh, needs attending to, that basically they'll, uh, they'll dispatch the relevant uh, text from the local depot and, and deal with it from there. So generally program maintenance two days a year. So we're looking at uptime in the high 90 percentile, which is really uh, what's needed as a, uh, you know, a core process. One, one more question um, on a, about a cotton gin. If you have a um, four megawatt solar system on a cotton gin, um, which obviously runs from about Easter till June, July, could you make hydrogen um, or ammonia during the off season? Oh, that's a really nice one, Andrew, that you will answer yes. And that's a really nice number because at four meg, um, you know, we generally run a three meg electrolyzer plant off that because we do generally allow for degradation. Um, so if you're signing a contract with someone as an off taker for that hydrogen and or that ammonia, um, basically that's, um, that's got to be reliable. So yeah, three meg and you're producing somewhere around uh, one and a half to two tonne a day of, uh, of hydrogen. Um, probably wouldn't suggest ammonia at that scale because uh, ammonia synthesis starts getting interesting around, say, 20, 30 meg. So a little okay. bit school, small for the ammonia story, but certainly for the gin itself, yeah, that's, that's a good amount of hydrogen and an offtake rate for that. In the retail world in transport, it might be around $10 a kilo. So you can do the maths. That's a decent, uh, a decent offtake. So, and that's really where hydrogen comes into its own. You know, it's a multi multi-day, multi-week, multi-month storage medium. Um, but we use batteries ourselves as, as an intraday, you know, half hourly, maximum hourly uh, storage buffer um, for control systems and such. So, yeah, that, that's that's a typical, that, that three megawatt, you know, that's a um, probably 500, 600 square meter plant. It's not a it's not a big plant. So that's a good thing. It's quite uh, real estate efficient as well. So, yeah, that's a great opportunity. So when they're not making money out of cotton, they've got the in, embedded cost of the PV there anyway. So, um, yeah, BOC and others, such as state and federal grants, would help uh, fund a deal to look at a uh, nine months of the year as a hydrogen offtake. Great, okay. Okay, I think that's about all the questions we've got now. So we might we might, um, we might leave it there, Neil. Um, I'll just start. Uh, one more, Andrew. Pleasure, Andrew. So, Sorry, back. One more from Phil. He's just wondering what the life span of an electrolyzer plan is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good, good question. Was it Phil? Sorry, Rebecca? Yeah, it was from yeah. Phil. Um, Phil, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, look, good question. I guess that's again why we've gone down this PEM technology route. So, the answer is 20 years is the uh, expected life. Um, and basically, the whole point that the funders like is basically that's commensurate with PV. So, if I've got a PV electrolyzer system, uh, and I keep the uh, the maintenance at that twice a year, well, I'm going to get 20 years out of it. And, and a bit like PV, at the end of 20 years, typically I'd allow 1% per annum, so I'm going to get at least 80% of the energy out of the PV and 80% of the hydrogen out of the electrolyzer. So it's not as if you throw it away in year 21. Um, yeah, it's not to say you'll still get another 10 or 20 years out of it, but yeah, it's all about, uh, like everything, we look after our, our equipment on farm and uh, it, it returns a dividend in terms of that life cycle. But yeah, 20 is a good number to work off with uh, both the PV and the electrolyzers. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, Neil, it's been great to have you on board for today's webinar. I appreciate uh, all that information. Pleasure, um, Andrew. And just, as, yep. just as people sign off, it'd be, it'd be great if you could just tick on those few boxes in that poll, please. And we could, if, if there's anything in particular you'd like to talk about as far as a, a project or an opportunity, we'd be pleased to make an introduction to Neil or we'll see if we can work with you ourselves. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of interest in this, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the um, Australian Renewable Energy Agency have both made big announcements around, um, about, around funds and finance for hydrogen projects at the moment. So, that, you know, there's, there's opportunities around to, to do some of this sort of stuff and also um, the use of hydrogen so, you know, if people are seriously interested in some projects, we'll, we'll sort of see if we can help point you in the right direction. Um, just as far as next, next steps, um, 
there's our QFF website there. We've got over 60 case studies there now with different all those different sectors and technologies um, I talked about earlier and you can search by location or sector or pumping or solar or whatever. Our next webinar is coming up next week. Um, it's with uh, one of our auditors um, that have done some work in horticulture, nursery and dairy uh, for our program and, and a lot, lot more extensive work outside our program uh, with the very intriguing topic of um, energy efficiency in jelly beans and um, we'll sort of give, explain how that um, pairing came about next week during the webinar and uh, if you've got any questions at all about energy uh, energy efficiency uh, if there's anything we can do to help there's that email address at the bottom there so please um, don't hesitate to get in touch and we will make this uh, presentation including the slides and the recording available to everyone after the um, after it's all finished um, and we'll sort of email everyone once that's available on our website. So without further ado, I'll um, wrap things up. And once again, thank you very much, Neil, for, for sharing with us. And, My um, pleasure, Andrew. Thank you for the invitation. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everyone.